Welcome everybody, thank you for coming. Um, this is the second uh, seminar, physics seminar, that uh, our students organize for um, this year. It's part of the physics student seminar series of the university. Um, it's organized by students for students and it's uh, supported by the IOP, the Institute of Physics. Um, what's the IOP? The IOP is the professional body for physicists in the UK. Uh, it's, uh, we are absolutely free to, to have them on board. Uh, they provide um, a space for our students to attend student uh, conferences, even organize events themselves. They offer a career advice and they provide uh, coffee and tea for our students. This is one. Um, so I would like to invite now Ben uh, Atkinson, who is uh, organizing the seminar series from the student side, to introduce our students. Thanks, All right, good evening, everyone. So, my speaker is Dr. Ellen Southall from the University of Chester. A bit of a background about her in the first degree was in physics and music, which she followed up with a master's in computer science and then a PhD focused on the dancing band scene in Chester and North Wales between 1930 and 1970. Between, uh, oh, since 2015, her research moved to the field of digital humanities, focusing on the application of immersive experiences which are aimed at increasing public engagement with science, technology and engineering. Tonight's talk is the physics of music and please give the panel a warm welcome. Guys, before we start, I forgot to mention that the loser are at the far end on the right and if there's a fire alarm, it's not a drill. Yeah. And we have to gather out just outside. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so without more ado, let's um, let's start to talk about the physics of music. As Ben said, um, I've always been interested in both, so this is a, a great opportunity to talk about them both all in one go. Um, what we're going to cover in the next 45-50 minutes or so is really just scratching the surface of certain aspects of the physics of sound. Um, particularly how different instruments generate different sound, which is why I've got selection with me. Um, relationships between the physics words for things like frequency and spectrum and the music words for things like pitch and timbre. Uh, we're going to look at a, a quick look at some interesting little back alleys in the, the history of sound recording. And we're also going to bring it right up to date with um, the physics and computer science of sound online, and in particular, um, why that mattered during, even more than usual during the pan pandemic lockdowns um, of the last couple of years. The picture of me with a saxophone in the church is going to be relevant later, honestly. It's partly to prove that I do actually play things in public occasionally, but it, it is relevant um, to, as it says here, why, why the um, things relationship between frequency and pitch matters if you're in a cold church. So, uh, sound waves. Um, the most general definition of sound for a physicist is, or for anybody really, is that it's a longitudinal wave in a medium such as air or water or rock. So a longitudinal wave is a wave where the compressions and the not compressed bits, what we call the rarefactions, are moving in the same direction as the energy. Um, I've got a, a video which kind of illustrates that a little bit better in, in a moment. These sound waves pass through the air um, and they hit your eardrum, among other things, and your, your eardrum then converts those movements of air molecules into movements of fluid molecules inside the eardrum, which then move in endings of nervous connections, which our brain then interprets that as sound. Um, human hearing varies a lot from one person to another. It will vary also according to the person's age and, and experiences. But very roughly speaking, we can hear down into the tens of hertz. So we will hear something as a very low frequency sound uh, between sort of 20 and 50, depending on your ears. Um, that will sound, that's a very, very low frequency hum. Below that, you don't hear it, you feel it. 
you might feel the vibration through through particularly your chest is quite a good resonator for that sort of thing but you tend not to hear it a young child with perfect hearing might hear up to 20,000 hertz so it's not 20 vibrations a second it's 20,000 vibrations a second um, by the time that child is uh, a young adult and they've encountered a few busy roads and discos the top will have been knocked off of that by the time they're my age, considerably more will have been knocked off of that. Um, so as you get older, just it's, it's one of these kind of use things that happens to the human body. Your ability to hear the very high frequencies does tend to decrease. So that's human hearing, um, but that's not how it is in all animals. Um, dogs, cats, mice and things can hear much, much higher than we can. Um, Bats famously need to be able to because they actually use their hearing in a different way. But even mice can hear much, much higher. Um, and that's partly because they make their own communication sounds are much, much higher because they've got tiny, tiny short vocal cords. So they can't make vocalizations of the frequencies we do. They need to be able to hear one another squeak so they can also hear much higher. Cats need to be able to see my, hear my squeaking so they can hear much higher as well. Elephants and, and, and big creatures like that, they have big long vocal cords. Um, they need to be able to hear other elephants tramping about. They have typically much lower range of hearing and they can hear through their feet as well. They can hear an elephant rumbling miles away and they, hear it, they can hear it through their feet as well as through their ears. So we tend to take it for granted that the range of hearing is human hearing but you know it depends what kind of creature you are um, and we're very human centric about this in that we say oh well anything over 20, hertz, 20 kilohertz is ultrasonic well for me it's probably rather less than 20 kilohertz um, and for some young children it would be more than 20 kilohertz for a bat it's a lot more than that so that is it's one of these kind of slightly arbitrary um, arbitrary denominations we have anything below 20 hertz we call that infrasonic in the same way that we have infrared and ultraviolet for light yeah okay that's a, li a little bit of um, terminology uh sound waves how we let's try and visualize some sound waves this is this is quite important because why sound is important to us is that it it transmits energy it allows us to know with our ears that something is happening over there because the energy has been transmitted through the air, the gap in between. Um, and so we have a, a very, very short, I'm just going to see I'm going to flip into um, the browser here and find this animation. Not my computer. That's better. Right. The, the thing we're looking at here is you can see an animation of air molecules banging into one another. If you imagine a loudspeaker cone here, it's coming forward on a regular basis and it's causing the air molecules to bang into one another. Now you can see the areas where the um, molecules are close together. It appears to move across the screen. So the energy is being transmitted across the screen in the same way. If I, if I pushed Garfield and then Garfield pushed the person behind him and the person behind him pushed the person behind them, the energy from my push would find its way across the room. I don't have to move very far to do this. I only have to move as far as pushing Garfield in order for the energy to be transmitted across the room. So the actual particles, if you look where the little red blob is, they're not moving much. It's the energy that's moving. And it's called a longitudinal wave because the direction of the particle moving backwards and forwards is in the same plane as the direction of the energy moving backwards and forwards. With a string, the string is moving that way and the standing wave, the energy is moving that way. So they're called transverse waves because the energy is not moving in the same direction as the particles. But sound waves are called uh, Longitudinal, longitudinal waves because everything's in the same plane. Okay, um, so let's go back to the slides. 
I'm whizzing through these slides quite quickly because I got rather enthusiastic and I've got a lot of them. So if anything really, really doesn't make sense and you want to stop me, then please just wave an arm or shout. Um, okay. So we want to talk tonight about sound and music. So I'm not going to dwell too much on, on what we've just been talking about. How do we use that basic physics to make musical sounds? Well, there's two basic ways of doing it. One is to set the air molecules in motion directly and make them, make them oscillate regularly directly. And the other one is to set something else in motion and get that to move the air. Okay? Um, so this is an example of the first uh, approach. And what happens with this first approach? Oh, I've got slightly ahead of myself. Oh, right. I'm going to go out of order. I'm going to be brave tonight. Um, with this kind of instrument, you blow across a hole and the air tends to just try and go down the hole. But it gets kind of backed up against other air molecules that are down there after a while. The pressure goes up in there. And so it then starts to squirt out of the hole. And then the pressure goes down in the tube. Um, and so it then starts to go down the tube again. So you get these um, high pressure, low pressure, high, little high pressure fronts moving their way down the tube. Um, and so there's no moving parts on this whatsoever. It's all to do with uh, the air either going down the tube because there's low pressure in the tube or not going down the tube because there's by that point high pressure in the tube. So. Okay, so that, that's a, 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 the most basic kind of no, no moving parts, set the air moving kind of approach. I'm going to go back a couple of slides now. Um, so that's that's the most basic approach with no moving parts. Other instruments all have moving parts. Um, we set them in motion in some way or another. We group musical instruments or musicians, musicologists group musical instruments into families. Um, and these are the four basic families, according to musicians. Um, there's the wind family, which includes the flutes, the no moving part family. Um, there's the string family, where it's all about something like that, which is either plucked, like I just did, or is bowed, like a violin, um, or is struck. Now, we don't get, use that many st struck string instruments in Western classical music. But they're very common folk music instruments, things like dulcimers, um, zithers, and things like that, where you have hammers that you actually hit the string with. Um, and there's also a, a baroque keyboard, I think it's the clavicle, something like that, where, where it's, it's little hammers that hit the string. Piano works that way as well. So stringed instruments include instruments where the string is struck. But they are, it's all they're all a way of setting a string in motion, and then the string sets, actually sets something else in motion, which sets the air in motion, but we'll come back to that in a moment. Um, percussion instruments um, are all the instruments that you hit in order to get a noise out of them. Um, I think it was um, Nick Mason, the drummer with Pink Floyd, that said, if you get two drummers together for dinner, it's like being on a train. If you get a lot of drummers together for dinner, it's like being in an earthquake because they all hit things. Yeah. Um, and that's percussion instruments, a very, very wide range of instruments, make a huge range of different noises, but they're all basically about things that you hit. Um, keyboards have their own family for musicians, because as far as musicians are concerned, um, you play them the same way. They all have the white keys and the black keys, and if you can play one of them, you can kind of learn to play any of the rest. But they actually can control any of the above. Um, a, a, a cinema organ certainly would have included any of the above. 
So it would have included flute to let pipes. Um, it would have included, uh, yes, it might well have included some, some, some strings that were hammered. Uh, it would definitely have included some percussion instruments. Um, so as far as musicians are concerned, keyboards are of their own family. As far as physicists are kind of concerned, it depends on what the keyboard actually triggers. And of course, keyboards can also be used and are often used to trigger the production of digital sounds as well. So stringed instruments, um, how do they work? I said before, it's not quite as simple as you pluck a string and that moves the air. I mean, that does happen. But if you just pluck a string and it moves the air, it's a very, very quiet sound. If you've ever heard somebody playing an electric guitar that's not plugged into the amplifier, it's not a lot of noise and there's no, no sustain to it at all. Um, so if you want to actually play a stringed instrument and have it heard more than a few feet away, you need some kind of a resonator. So here's an example and there, oh, there is an example as well. Here's my strings strung between, they're actually what counts from a physics point of view is the nut up there and that one down there, that's, that's the length of the string, unless I shorten the string by putting my finger down behind a fret, then the length of the string is from the fret to there. Um, the string starts something in motion. What it starts in motion is this wooden body. So if I pluck that string, it's very quiet, even with the wooden body in this case, it's a small quiet instrument. But if I pluck that string, the vibration from the string goes through the bridge into this uh, wooden body. The wooden body then vibrates and that, vi that vibration then comes out through the sound hole and out into the rest of the world. Um, exactly the same principle with the cello up there. Those F holes, those decorative looking F holes, their sound holes exactly the same with this. Without that, the sound would rattle around inside. You'd still hear something, but you wouldn't get as much volume. So the wooden box is actually really important on an acoustic uh, stringed instrument, less so with an electric one, but you still need something to pick up the movement of the string. So we'll come back to the ukulele in a moment. Um, I promise my one and only equation for the evening, um, because it, this is all kind of, if, you, if you've got the equation for one of these, it works for all the rest. Um, the frequency that you get if you pluck a string on a ukulele, um, that's the, the fundamental frequency, the easiest frequency to get, um, is given by that equation over there. So it's related to the length. So L is down there, the length of the string. So the more the length of the string goes up, that, that, will, that will decrease the frequency because it's underneath the line there, it's being divided by. It's also affected by the tension in the string um, and the mass per unit length. The tension in the string, you, would, you change by turning these things. The mass per unit length, you won't be able to see from over there, but you've all seen a bass guitar or a cello or a ukulele or something at some point. On a ukulele, it's a bit weird. The lowest string is the second one in, and that's the thickest one. The highest string is this one up here, and that's the thinnest one. So you've got more nylon per centimetre in this string than you have in this string. And that's what controls the, the basic range it can get. You control the rest of it with the, um, the tuning pegs. Um, OK, so given all that, what happens if our string is shorter? Well, if it's shorter, then we're going to get a higher frequency. So the, the further I go up the fretboard, the higher the pitch gets. Um, if the tension is higher, um, it squeaks or in a more distressed fashion, uh, its pitch goes higher as well. What happens if the room temperature is higher? This is less obvious. There's nothing in that, freak, that equation that mentions room temperature. So why would this be affected by room temperature? 
Yeah. Usually the, the strings go out of tune, they, they are the tune lower, like you know, it's very hot. In the, in the but it does indeed get lower if it's hot, that's true. And the reason for that is what happens to things when they get hot? Expand. Hmm? They expand, absolutely. But surely it all expands. Expand at different rates. Hmm? Probably expands at different rates. Exactly, yeah. So the wood is going to expand at one rate, the nylon is going to expand at another rate. Um, it affects an instrument like this somewhat. Nylon expands a bit when it gets hot, wood expands to a slightly different weight when it's getting hot. It really affects electric guitars because the body of the instrument um, is made of wood, expands a bit when it gets hot, but not that much. The strings are made of metal, and we all know what metal does when it gets hot. Now, if the string expands, then that means that you have less tension in the string, and therefore the frequency goes down. Remember that, we'll come back to that in a few, in a, a few minutes. Okay. Um, I was going to do some demonstrations with um, these graphs and things, but it's really fiddly to actually get the software to work to order um, and to get the, the, the examples to happen to order as well. So here's some I made earlier. I've taken the blueprint approach again. I've, I've made the graphs and things earlier. Um, if you're going to play a ukulele with a group of ukuleles, then you all want to be playing at the same pitch, more or less. Um, and the standard these days in most places is that the A string should be vibrating at 440 cycles per second. That's not a universal standard throughout the whole world even now. A hundred years ago there was, it was much less standardised, but that's the normal standard now. So first thing I did was to record my A string and as you can see my um, audition software said, yep, yeah, that's 440. I don't need to fire up the software. I can just use one of these. But it's doing exactly the same thing. It's measuring the frequency and it tells me when A is 440. So if I just pluck the A string, that trace up the top there is what I get. So you can see the very the rapid onset of that note and then it gradually gets quieter as the vibration dies away. Um, my next little experiment that I did was to now that's not actually going very far. That's that's you know a few hertz, but most people can hear that that difference. Um, and you can certainly hear it if my ukulele is tuned to one frequency and yours is tuned to another. I'm just going to make sure that's retuned properly. There's a reason why I need to get this right. That's better. Okay, now that's, that's A440 on that string. A440 on this string, I need to put press down the same fret. Pretty much the same note. If I play them at the same time, it's not perfect because this ukulele frets isn't perfect, but it's pretty close. However, if I shove my thumb in like that, I'm still pressing down the same fret, but it's a different note. Can you hear that? Now that, not almost, but not quite the same note, is what you get here, gives you that kind of trace there. What we're looking at there is beats. Physics students will have heard of beats, I hope, at some point. Um, beats is where you have two frequencies that are almost the same, and um, the vibrations add together, and, so, and sometimes they will add together and give you a louder sound, and other times they will subtract from one another and give you almost nothing. And when you're sufficiently far out from one another. These beats happen very fr frequently. Uh, when you're very close, they will happen very slowly. And, and in the days before electronic tuners, that was how we tuned things. We were listening for beats, and that is still how piano tuners often work. 
Um, and it, it's, I find it satisfying to actually see that this works. You know, you see graphs like this in textbooks and they say, oh, this is what you're looking for with beats. And um, yeah, it works. You can use software like, like Audition with something like this. And you can see that that actually does happen. OK, um, wind instruments. I'm on more home turf here, really, because my, I'm a clarinet and saxophone player, so I know I'm more comfortable with wind instruments. Um, so I, we've mentioned earlier how, how flutes work. Organ pipes are automated flutes. Yeah, um, and with an organ pipe, instead of somebody having to stand there and go, you'd need a lot of people to do that and they'd need not a lot of air. Um, what you have instead is a pump down here. It pumps air into this part of the pipe and then it will get to that part of the pipe and it will either go down the pipe if there's low pressure in the pipe or it will shoot out the side if there's high pressure in the pipe. And you get these successions of, of low pressure and high pressure areas. Um, we've got one of these works exactly the same way. Organ pipes are big recorders, most of them, not all of them. But organ pipes are basically big recorders that way up with a pump fitted at this end. That's how that's how your flute pipes and recorder work on a, an organ even. Um, the other main type of wind instrument is the reed instrument and they come in two varieties. I've only got one with me tonight. This is a single reed instrument. Um, so-called because it has a single reed that you can also have double reed instruments where you have two reeds that kind of clap together like that and you hold them between your lips. Um, this is a single reed instrument. So we have here a piece of a rondo donax, which is a, a kind of literally a reed, um, which has been dried out and carefully shaped and you strap it onto a mouthpiece. The mouthpiece has a slight curve to it your lips hold the reed closer to the mouthpiece and then you put some air through it and the reed waggles back and forwards. Not actually exactly the frequency that you're trying to play, but it's that it's that elasticity in the reed that sets the air in motion and then your instrument then controls the frequency that you're trying to that you want to produce. Um, lots of other wind instruments work in a similar way. Our vocal cords basically work in the same way two chords um, held under tension, you blow air through the gap between them and they, they synthetically vibrate as a result. Uh, brass instruments, um, people who as children liked blowing raspberries grow up to be brass players because that's what you do in order to get a noise out of a brass instrument. You blow a raspberry into a cup shaped mouthpiece, the vibrations of the raspberry are then captured and turned into music. Um, but that's that's basic. It's, it's exactly the same idea of having things which will vibrate regularly in an airstream. Um, flutes produce or can at least produce lovely pure spe um, frequency spectrums. All the other instruments less so because there's more moving parts moving in different ways. So this is my primary school recorder. Still got the teeth marks in it because I didn't know you weren't supposed to bite them at that age. Um, and so I, I played some tunes into my audition software, something like. Now. That is there's no moving parts. I have very little control over the sound that comes out of that other than by putting more or less air down it. Um, and the, the waveform that you get if you record that is almost, not quite, but almost a perfect sine wave. There's not really anything getting in the way of the air just moving naturally, changing its mind about whether it's going to come out of that hole or go down the tube. Um, recorders are basically a straight pipe with one of these triple blade setups at the end. I can get two different harmonics out of it quite easily. So um, this is the fundamental frequency. This is the lowest frequency I can get out of this length of tube. Now, if I 
just slightly change the way I blow. Actually, I have to get three different frequencies out there. Now that's what I've done here. This one on the left is the lower frequency, the one on the right is the higher frequency. Um, that's the fundamental frequency of my recorder. That is, you know, something going on in the background, central heating pump maybe. Um, that's the, the fundamental frequency for D on this recorder. You notice that's completely absent in this recording. That's an octave higher. This is double the frequency and that's, that's really strong um, at that level. And also the other kind of intermediate frequencies, are, that one's still there. That one is kind of still there, but it's very weak. Um, and with woodwind instruments like this, we usually only work with the, the fundamental, the first harmonic, maybe the second, if you're being really ambitious, the third. Um, we don't use that many different harmonics with woodwind instruments. Brass instruments are all about harmonics. You can play tunes on the brass instrument without needing to change the length, just by going up and down the harmonics. Okay, so, one final thing to note on this, um, if I cover all the holes, I'm effectively using the whole tube. If I don't cover any of them, what's actually happening is that the tube stops there. I'm actually only using a tube that long. Um, so you might expect that this thing here, missing its mouthpiece at the moment, it's almost the same length. Can you see where the mouthpiece goes on is more or less at the same point as the, the tipple blade on this one. You might expect it would produce about the same frequency, just about the same length. It's even made by the same company 30 odd years later. Um, but this is actually a reproduction of the distant ancestor of the clarinet. So if I play the same tune on this, it's a completely different sound and it's a lot lower but at the same length so how does that work because if we think back to our, our um, equation earlier on it's not quite the same equation for these but it's very similar length should you know how? Why? Well, this thing, we call this an open pipe because there's a hole at that end and there's a hole at this end. You might think this is also open because I have to get the air in somehow, but as far as physicists are concerned, it's a closed pipe because every cycle of the reed, it is actually closed. And that makes enough difference to how it works that you get a lower frequency. Um, in this case, you also get different arrangement of frequencies for overtones as well for a straight pipe like this. Um, so you get a different sound. I said it's, you know, that's definitely not a sine wave, is it? It's a kind of triangular wave with the top and bottom chopped off. And that's that's fairly typical for reed type instruments. I'm just going to play, try and get a few different harmonics out of this. without moving my hands. That was all done with throat and lip. And those are the different harmonics you can get out of an instrument like this. You get you start lower, but you can get higher quicker on a closed pipe. So it has its advantages and disadvantages, which I won't bore you with now, but it means you need more keys, basically, on a clarinet. But um, you also get a bigger range. And it's purely because the thing that gets the, the noise going in the first place is a different shape, works in a different way. Yeah? But if you change the material, would you be able to cut away some frequencies and make it sound You can higher? do a lot with the, um, the basic sound with this part. Um, clarinetists and saxophone players and brass players and wind players get terribly excited about mouthpieces. Um, 
the, the most basic sort is, you know, it has the, the, the right size shape hole at the end to, to attach the reed to, but it, it, get, it becomes circular as soon as it can for the minimum amount of turbulence. Um, but if you put baffles and things in the way, if you change the interior shape of that, you get, you emphasize more or, diff, more or less different frequencies. So if you, want to, if you want to play a real kind of rock and roll sax kind of sound with a real harsh sound, you just put lots of baffles in there. Uh, and, and so that's, although this is the majority of the instrument, this is the business end. So this it's is, the mouthpiece, not the material that the yeah. tube the is made well, uh, and now the way then. it vibrates. Now then, yes. <laughs> Whole separate argument there. Um, people will sell you recorders made out of particular woods and swear to you that it makes a different sound. And maybe it does a bit. They will also sell you these things that hold the reed onto the mouthpiece with a bit of gold plate on and tell you that's how it changes the sound as well. I'm less convinced about that. <laughs> um, but yes, the, 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 the material makes a bit of difference. This makes far more difference. Okay, um, I've mentioned brass players earlier on and we have how are we doing for time? We have a lovely video here. Um, I've, already, I've already got that one, haven't I? Yeah. So, if somebody is learning to play the violin and they're doing that with their wrist, and they really should be doing that with their wrist, the violin teacher can say, don't do that with your wrist, do that. If somebody is learning to play the clarinet um, or learning to sing and they're making a bad sound, you can't always see what's going on because so much of it is going on in here or down here. Um, and that's why um, MRI scanners have really been popular with people doing music research, music physics research in the last few years. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to show you the whole layout, eight minutes, 50 seconds of this. I'm just going to show you some snippets. This is um, the, a, a well-known French horn player, um, goes to a research institute in Germany um, and gets inside an MRI scanner. Now the actual horn bit of the horn obviously is outside the scanner because scanners don't like metal. So she connects to that a long thin plastic tube and a plastic mouthpiece takes that in with her and blows into that and that means that you can then see what's going on in her mouth her throat and even at, at some points in the, the video what's going on in her chest yeah just note there she played that tune without any valves or anything like that this is a natural horn and that's all done by selecting different harmonics. So the first thing that's shown you is the difference between just starting a note and moving up and down the harmonics where she has to move her um, tongue to change the mouth cavity shape to do that. And the second one, she's tonguing the note. So she's going t-t-t and that actually stops and starts the note. And you can, you can see her tongue doing contortions to make that happen. I'm just going to move on a little bit further. Um, So at this point, she's actually playing scales, um, again, without valves, and all the pitch changes are to do with the, sh the shape of uh, the, the mouth cavity. You can 
see the voice box. This last bit, a thing that brass players do, but most woodwind players, other than flute players, don't do. If you want to articulate notes very fast, it gets you get to a point where you can't go ta 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 any faster. Brass players and flute players go do is go ta 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 or even ta 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 and that's what she's doing here. So you can actually see the back of her tongue and the front of her tongue articulating. OK, I mean, there's hours more where that comes from. And if you are a wind player of any description, that is just utterly fascinating because you think, oh, that's why I do that. That's why that happens. All oh, right. Uh, so yeah, that is that is um, one of the big things that you learn. The first thing you learn when you play a wind instrument is how to make the tubes the right thing. That's moving your fingers. You then spend the next n decades getting this bit right because they, that changes the tone and changes the pitch. Um, you might be wondering what this was doing here. It's not me wanting a cup of tea because there's tea over there. Um, it, it's not actually. It doesn't look as though it's going to be a great teacup because it's got holes in the front. Actually, they don't go all the way through, so you could put tea in it. But um, it does have a use, a musical use. Other than a teacup, it's a kind of musical instrument. Yeah, it's an ocarina. It's an ocarina, indeed, <laughs> absolutely. Now, real ocarinas um, originally, I think, were made out of gourds. Um, it Italian musicians made them into kind of sweet potato-shaped things with a mouthpiece attached. And what's going on here? It ha I mean, how do you how do you measure the length of one of those tubes? Eh? It's not a tube in the first place. It doesn't work as a tube. It's actually a Helmholtz resonator is the name for it. And what matters is the ratio of the volume of the whole area. It's actually got a, a fipple blade there and a mouthpiece there. Um, it's the ratio of the, the volume between the two walls of the cup and the amount of volume that is uncovered by my fingers. That gives you your frequency. Bizarrely, exactly the same principle applies to the, the mechanism that drives your, your microwave oven and various other things like that. So it also matters when you're designing musical instruments. Most musical instruments are not perfectly straight tubes like this. They have bells at the end, they have kinks and, and different shaped holes and things like that. And that is to do with the fact that you don't actually make a musical instrument just with its length, its volume and, and relative volume of different lengths also affect all kinds of things. Um, OK, I mentioned um, why does it matter to trying to play in a cold church? When I was trying to play my saxophone in a cold church a few weeks ago, well, it's quite as cold as it is now, just cold enough. Wind instruments, when it gets cold, they go flat. Um, whereas stringed instruments, when it gets cold, <coughs> they go sharp. Electronic instruments just sit there and go, we don't do either. Um, I was trying to play in tune with an, ele an electronic keyboard, and the keyboard was tuned to A442, not A440, and my saxophone was going, you want to go up there in this weather? So I had to screw the mouthpiece right onto the onto the saxophone to tune it up as much, you know, not quite as much as I could, but tune it up a long way. Um, so things like air temperature um, and mouth cavity and stuff like that, these, these are all the kind of inside story of getting it musical instruments to work and getting a music performance to work, uh, which are 
physics at least as much as they are anything to do with, with performing arts. OK, um, another place where you where the physics of music uh, is maybe a little bit unexpected um, is in architecture and even archaeology. Um, some research has been done recently at the University of Salford because I think it's um, Thomas Hardy in Tess of the Dyfergirls mentions that if you stand in um, uh, Stonehenge in a storm with a strong wind, it, the whole place kind of vibrates. And people thought for a long time that was Thomas Hardy being a bit fanciful and arty. Actually, it's true, it does. Mm. Um, and it would have done it even more so when all the stones were standing. And this has been proven um, by research in an anechoic chamber at, at Salford University. They also proved various things about what it would sound like if you were you know, taking part in a ritual inside, inside that circle of stones. So it's not just a big impressive circle of big heavy things. It's also, you know, the closest, well, it's a version of a cathedral, I guess, if you like. It has its own, its own atmosphere, even though it's got holes in. Um, there's enough there to, to give, have a, an acoustic effect. Right, last instrument family of the evening, the ones that you hit. Um, and these can be, I mean, they're all difficult to record in their own ways, but these can be particularly difficult to record because the sound happens very quickly and often over a very high frequency range. So if I do that, I mean, deliberately stopping it so that these don't rattle too much. But that's what I recorded. And the second peak is these things. Um, but even before the second peak starts, you get this, this range of frequencies. This is low frequencies. Those are off the top of human hearing. You get all of those frequencies out of a sudden impulse like this. These are also percussion instruments. You don't hit them. You wouldn't do that to temple bells but they hit each other. Um, now, if you get close enough to them, you can actually hear a slight beat there, a slight kind of wavy sound, a bit like that image I had of the ukulele out of tune earlier. And if you look at the, the frequency chart there, um, you can see that there are actually two fundamental frequencies, two first harmonics, two second harmonics. They're tuned to two very slightly different frequencies, and that is part of the sound, the set of temple bells, is that they have this slightly unearthly beat. The other thing I love about this recording is that once the, once the sound has got going, you have a, a lovely dec decline, um, almost a, a perfect exponential decay, um, from the loudest to the to almost not there. Um, and so, you know, it's rather like the flute, which does exactly what it's supposed to do. It doesn't have other things interfering. Um, these do. And the final thing to note about this, I was going to bring my husband's cymbal in, but we decided that would be a bit over for, for, for this. So I brought those instead. Um, but if if you are, if you know a drummer or if you meet a drummer and you ask them nicely, um, go over to one of their bigger cymbals and just tap it gently. You will immediately hear that re that recognisable cymbal noise, splash kind of sound. If you get your ear within an inch or two of the cymbal, you can hear the fundamental frequency of the cymbal as well, and it goes on for much longer than the splash sound. It will still be going 30 seconds because of a minute later. And you can see that happening here as well. The lower frequency is still quite loud when the top frequency frequencies have long since gone. Um, so, yeah, I think that's, that, that was all I was going to say about percussion instruments at this point. I know I've got other slides I need to move on, but there's, there's a lot more that you could say. Oh, no, there's not quite. I was talking about symbols. Um, as I say, we didn't bring This is a really nice video, um, high speed photography of what happens when you hit a symbol. And I'm st I've stopped it at that point because they've actually covered the symbol with sand. 
so that you can see the see the effect of it being hit. Um, and this is really, really, really slowed down, and it shows you what a symbol actually does. We've actually got. The symbols are a, a three dimensional and you can use them to different versions of this and the Mm. Almost yeah. like a membrane. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Mm. Um, and I mean, symbols are actually quite expensive, good ones. And the reason for that is they have to withstand being thumped on a regular basis for hours on end, but they also have to be able to do that kind of thing. So they're, they're a, a bit of a triumph of metallurgy, really, the, the, the fact that they don't just kind of crack and fall apart after. A, uh, a few of those is is why they're not cheap. Okay. Um, yes. So um, I think I'd better move on. Actually, right. Why Middle C is where it is. I promised I was going to talk about this, so I'm just going to uh, give a, a, little, a little moment on this. Um, when I was when I was small. Uh, um, if you wanted to find middle C on a piano, you looked for the lock. Because acoustic pianos, uh, you could always, they always had a lid that you could lock down to stop jam covered fingers from invading them when the owner was out. Um, and so the middle C was always somewhere near the lid. And the C is the white note to the left of the, the pair of black notes, I suppose, the trio of black notes. And so that's middle C, it's the one that is the C that's closest to the lock. Harder to find on an on a, on a electronic issue because they tend not to have a lot. But anyway, um, so that's middle C. This is C5, the C above it, which is an octave higher or double the frequency. But why is that middle C? Why put that one by the lock? It comes back to comes back to the length of our vocal cords again, um, and um, kind of natural um, note that we might want to sing at. So, right, a um, bit of community singing then. I'm going to ask you all to sing a scale, yeah? preferably a major one. Nobody's listening, so it doesn't matter if you do it really badly. But we can start. Everybody basically sing that scale. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right then, gentlemen only. Yeah. <laughs> They're not singing at the same frequency as me, are they? Yeah. No. No. You're, but you're you're actually most likely singing an octave below, um, because typically men have longer, adult men have longer vocal cords than. Um, adult females, um, long enough that your comfortable range will tend to be an octave lower. Uh, um, and even though, if you look at the range of the vocal ranges for women, they, you know their natural ranges can vary quite a lot from people with very low ra ranges to very high ranges. Likewise, for men, you have basses all the way up to very high tenors. There's this patch in the middle where everybody can sing the same notes even if they're an octave out. So we all went la, 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 or men an octave lower. You can all sing that range, okay. Um, let's try a different scale. <laughs> now, what, what you can try and do with that scale is you can maybe go an octave lower, but that's low, too low for some people. 
we often encounter this in the ukulele group that the, the tunes have been written for convenience on the ukulele fretboard, not for convenience of singing, so nobody can actually sing them. Um, but this, that, no, that scale starting on C, pretty much everybody can sing that. It will be high for some people, it will be low for others, but it, most people can sing it. So if you were designing a piano from scratch and you wanted to be able to accompany people singing, you'd put that vocal range in the middle of it. And then other notes kind of work their way out from there. So that's why it's approximately that frequency but why exactly the frequency is? Well, that goes back to the design of church organs and things like that. Certain pipes are lengths of pipe are more convenient to make than others. Um, if you have an eight foot pipe as your kind of standard, you can divide that by two and make it four foot. You can divide it by two again, make it two foot. You can multiply it by two and make it 16 foot. And it turns out that's kind of round about middle C-ish. Um, gives you gives you that kind or AC anyway gives you a length which divides fairly neatly and or a church organ um, sets of stops like this are still labelled four foot four foot eight foot sixteen foot and they don't mean that they're they're all they're all going to play C they mean that if we if we take um, that length that set of pipes as our standard. The set of pipes which are on the four foot stop will be an octave higher, so they will be half the length, they will be twice the frequency. The set of pipes on the 16 foot stop will be um, twice the length, therefore half the frequency or an octave lower. Um, computer scientists will get all excited when they see 2, 4, 6, 2, 4, 8, 16. Uh, and, you know, but so similar sort of logic really is that if you can keep multiplying things, you can keep. Uh, by two, then that, that makes, I guess, building an organ easier. So that's part of the reason why that particular note is the one that got settled on as being the middle of the piano. Why it's called C is a whole other rabbit hole. If anybody really wants to know more about that, I've done a bit of digging, not really got to come to a, a satisfactory answer, but there are some possible explanations for that. But the reason that octave is in the middle of the piano is because it surrounds the, the octave that we can all see. Um, okay, physics and sound recording. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. You've all seen, you know, photographs of EMI Abbey Road in the 1950s, people doing things with electrical recording. Everybody, I think, has heard of Thomas Edison and, and his early attempts at recording, very successful attempts at recording, which um, set off the rest of what we know about. But a guy that is really only recently come back to, to note is this guy de Martinville. Um, yes, here we go. And um, he was a, a French um, na natural philosopher um, in the 19th century, a little bit before Edison. And he was also researching recording sound, but he had a different approach to it. He wasn't too bothered about being able to play it back. He was satisfied to start with if he could just make some kind of a record, record of it. And the way he did it was very much the same way that we still do um, with me measuring earthquakes, which was a kind of seismograph. Um, so he, he connected his membrane that received the sound to a pen instead of a stylus um, and had it trace out the waveform. Um, and this is some computer scientists have kind of tried to work out what that would mean in terms of the sound. They know that he tried, that his sample song was a French folk song called Au Claire de la Luna. I'll, sh I'll try and sing it to you first so you know what you're listening for. Okay, so that's what he sort of sang in. This is what the computer scientists have got out of here, one of his recordings on paper. Sounds a bit like Eau de Claire de la Luna. So the notes are, 
I notice they're kind of there, aren't they? We don't know for certain if that paper, because we don't have a record of how fast the paper was moving under pen. So he might have sung it higher frequency and with the paper moving faster and the whole bit. We don't know because there was no calibration, but you can kind of get out of that something that sounds a bit like Au Claire de la Luna. Um, I'll do this one. You can see we're nearly there. Um, yes, yeah, so um, that was 1860. Thomas Edison's actual phonograph, which can play back as well as recording, was a few years later. But what I guess one of the things this tells us was that was a very exciting time to be involved in this kind of physics because people were using lots of different approaches to try and work out what sound was and how to record it, how to reproduce it. Um, it wasn't until the 19th, it was a half a century later before people actually started to do it electrically. Um, and so at this point, it's all happening mechanically and people are still, still trying to decide what's the best way to do it. Um, 1980s, so not quite 100 years later, um, the electrical recording you saw in the Abbey Road photo was being replaced by digital recording. Um, now, the, the simple way to explain digital recording is you start off with a waveform, like the one at the top, like those ones I recorded, the, my recorder or, or ukulele, and then you kind of measure the height or depth of the waveform at any particular point in time, and you assign that a number, and you then store the number in your computer. And then when you want to play it back, you read back the numbers and you, you convert them into voltages, which can then be used to, to drive a speaker backwards and forwards, and that gives you a, an approximation of the sound you originally recorded. That's the simple explanation. Actually, what goes on in any kind of digital audio recording or playback is a lot more complicated. Um, because to do it that way, where you measure things 16,000 or 64,000 times a second, takes a huge amount of memory, huge amount of processing. It is terribly inefficient. Um, so what actually goes on in your analog to digital and back to analog converter is a lot of compression, compression algorithms, which are basically saying, has anything changed since the last time we measured this? Yeah, it was playing A440 the last time we measured it a quarter of a second ago. It's still playing A440 now. Nothing's changed. Right, I won't record anything. And you only actually make a note of what's changed. That's effectively one of the ways of doing it. Um, the, the maths which is required to make that work is incredibly complicated. And there's lots of different ways of doing it for different purposes. It's all based on that equation that I showed you at the beginning, and it's relative slow. It's all based on simple harmonic motion, equations for standing waves, um, and equations based on it, such as, uh, such as techniques like Fourier analysis and synthesis. Um, so it all goes back to that same relatively straightforward bit of maths. Um, but what we're doing now would not work without the compression algorithms and so on as well. Um, the other thing about which was very quickly realized, um, if you can record things digitally, you can synthesize them digitally. You can pretend that there was a noise. You can, you can create that waveform in the computer without needing the original, just by knowing what it should sound like. And so um, your 1980s Human League records are, are all about starting here rather than starting there, or the synthesizer parts of tomorrow at least. Um, modern digital audio workstations like, like the one in the image there, they look like old-fashioned mixing desks and so on, um, but what's going on behind them <coughs> is, to say, is you're starting here and you're maybe tweaking this to make it sound like you're in a cathedral or something, Again, that's equations to, to simulate the cathedral echo effect. It only turns into this kind of analog uh, waveform with the complete wave when you actually want to send it out to your loudspeakers. Okay, sound online. Um, 
became very, very important all of a sudden at the beginning of 2020. Um, suddenly being able to talk to people online in real time um, and share videos and so on in life was, was really important. I just want to show you though something um, which caused, uh, well always has caused problems with um, any kind of, I'm not sure if I put this one on here, um, any kind of online transmission of data um, and that's the way the data is actually transmitted. Now what we're looking at here, post one is me in my uh, home office during lockdown. Um, post two is Theo in his home office during lockdown and I'm trying to get a video from my home office to Theo's home office. Now the way the internet works it doesn't, it's not like an old-fashioned telephone connection. We don't kind of make a single connection between me and Theo and use that connection all the way through the conversation. The data will be sent by whatever route is convenient, by whatever route is free, at the point when they're sent it off. Now those three blobs, if you imagine them as being all part of the word hello, yeah, um, they're all sent Wait for them to go. They're all sent at the same time. Um, they all take different routes and they take different amounts of time to arrive. And they don't arrive in the order that they were sent. So when they arrive, they then have to be reassembled in the order, in the right order, which is all kind of, it's in the metadata. It says I was first, I was sent at this time. Um, and that takes a little bit longer when the data arrives at your computer and has to be resorted, that takes a little bit longer. So that's, that's one of the problems, um, but there are others. Now, well, I'll leave that going, I'm just gonna do a quick demo. Um, first, I'm gonna clap and I want you to clap in time with me, okay? straightforward isn't it that, that's not too bad to do now I'm going to do that again and I want you to clap just after me so if I go that I want it I want to go so you're just after me okay so da -da, da -da. I'm going to do the dun and you're going to do the dun okay once you get used to that you can do that and actually, you're, you're clapping at the same rate as me, you're just a little bit behind me. And this is where kind of online karaoke like um, happened quite a lot during lockdown, um, where one person would be strumming their, their ukulele in North Wales, and 500 people all around the world would also be strumming, strumming their ukuleles and singing along. It didn't matter that the people around the world were slightly behind the original player because they were only playing to themselves. Where the trouble starts is if I'm clapping at this rate, you're slightly behind me, and I can hear you by it behind me, and then I get put off by the fact that you're behind me, and I try to slow down to get with you, and then you slow down to get behind me. That, that's not sustainable. You can't play music that way. So that was why there was a lot of online karaoke. It's also the reason why uh, Zoom calls can be a bit frustrating because we naturally, as human beings, we take turns in conversations. We wait until somebody else has kind of stopped and taken a breath, and at that point, we come in with our point. Um, that's called polite conversation, and it takes young children quite a long time to learn it quite often. But if if you've got people around the network who, you know, one of them is in the middle of Wales at the far end of a very bad copper connection, and somebody else is um, in, sitting at the National Computer Centre on the fastest connection known to man, um, they won't hear somebody else finish their point at the same time. So the person in the National Computer Centre will say, oh, I can join in now, and they will start 
before this person in Wales has even realised that that person has finished. And then the person in Wales will think, oh, that person has just finished and they'll come in as well. So this, this, these kind of differences in, in, in delays um, caused uh, a lot of hassle um, using Zoom. It, and it's actually worse if you don't know why. If you know why, you forgive people for, for being kind of out of sync. If you don't know why, you just think they're being rude. Um, so that was part of the part of the stress of lockdown was was the, the thing happened when you were supposed to. Now, musicians generally like to play together. We're we're pack animals. Yeah, we don't we don't like being on our own for months on end, not able to get together. And so traditionally people have always said you can't play music online too much latency that effect i was just demonstrating just stops it from working actually you kind of can uh, what you have to do is you have to cut that latency down to the absolute bare minimum and surprisingly the internet itself is not the biggest problem a large part of the problem is the analog to digital converter all computer all laptops today have one built in that's that's what connects the microphone to the computer it's not designed to be particularly fast it doesn't need to be until you're wanting to play music online with other people and then the fact that it's a bit on the on the sluggish side becomes a problem however if you get a really fast interface that does the analog to digital conversion really fast and you plug that into your computer and connect that effectively straight to your to, your, to Zoom. Um, that cuts out a lot of the delay. You can also cut out more delay by moving to somewhere with a fast internet connection. That does help. Um, by making sure there aren't any wireless connections between your microphone and the internet. Garfield and I ended up with wires all around the flat. Yeah, we haven't used wired connections for years, and suddenly there's wires everywhere, and that was why. Um, but the final thing that you have to develop is tolerance of poor sound quality. Because of that thing I was showing you earlier, where the bits of a packet, or well, the different packets, the bits of the sound, don't all arrive in the right order, one of the things that things like Jam Kazan do is they say, oh, well, if it hasn't arrived by the time I'm supposed to be playing this sound, I'll just play you the beginning and the middle. Um, we haven't got the end yet, sorry it hasn't arrived. Um, and that, that, as anybody that's ever done any Fourier analysis or anything like that, when you start taking information out of the signal, you get spurious sounds that aren't really there, you get rotten sound quality. So yes, you can do, you can get the latency down to a point where you can play together, and we did very successfully. Um, this is this is me up there at the back, my friend Gordon on the alto there, Stephen on the on the baritone on the right there. Uh, Gordon somewhere in Stockport, Stephen somewhere out in deepish, deepest um, uh, Cheshire somewhere, and I was in Chester. We did play together. In fact, five or six of us played together in the end. But the sound quality wasn't great. Um, it was newish software, so it was occasionally a bit wobbly. But it is possible. It can be done. So one of the things the pandemic has taught us is that we. You know, there are ways around 85% of this problem, not all of it, but there are ways around quite a lot of it. OK, so um, to wrap <coughs> up then. If you are a musician or you're just really interested in music or hi-fi or, or anything like that, it definitely helps to understand what's actually going on from a physics point of view when music is being made recorded, played back, and so on. Um, understanding that what musicians call pitch is, an, is basically the same thing as what physicists call frequency. Likewise, timbre and, frequent, uh, like timbre and spectrum, loudness and amplitude, you know, those, those words translate pretty exactly between the, the two fields. Um, and it definitely helps if you're a musician. Um, for the reason I gave before, for wind players particularly, it really helps because you can't see. So being able to imagine what's going on um, and to understand what's actually what has to happen in here in order to get the right thing out of those is really helpful. 
If you're going to design or maintain or repair musical instruments, regardless of whether they're the old fashioned analog ones or digital ones, you have to understand the physics. If they're digital ones, you really have to understand the physics. Well, they cut slightly different. These are mechanical. These are, these are 19th century technology that came along. You know, this was only possible because of um, developments that also led to steam engines and things like that. Um, so these are 19th century technology. Um, digital instruments uh, depend entirely on these, these equations and algorithms that allow us to uh, process the, this, the digital version of the signal so much more quickly. So understanding the physics is really important. Um, and understanding the physics is really important if you're holding a concert and you're, you, you, know, the, you want to make sure that the horn will be suitable for your ensemble or something like that. What works for a rock group does not work for a, a church choir and vice versa. Um, so, so that's kind of physics and music. But the other really interesting thing I think about all of this is that those same equations that you use to describe the sine wave or the not quite sine wave that I got out of the Shalomo, um, those exact same equations are used in so many other places as well. I've got a random list here of earthquakes and engineering faults and quantum mechanics and astronomy and internet communication and vehicle design. You know when people talk about tuning up a car, they mean it literally. Um, making sure that the exhaust pipe is, is the right length and shape and everything relative to the capacity and pressure and so on coming out of the engine. That, that is tuning up. It's the same again. It's those equations again. Um, likewise, suspension only works if, you know, can only be made to work properly if you understand those equations. So, um, one that I, I used to teach part of this for the level four physics course and well, that was one of the things I emphasised. Those equations can be a bit much to get to grips with at first, but they're not just about sound. They're not just about music. They're about, uh, you know, can be used in so many other places as well. So that basically is it. Any questions? Oh, right. tune, but it's also got a chamber, hasn't it? Yeah, the bagpipe is a double reed instrument like an oboe. Um, and each one, well, the, the, the chanter, the bit that sticks out to the bottom of the bag like this, um, this, is, this has got a kind of mechanical flute at the top. The bagpipe chanter has a mechanical oboe. So inside this part of the chanter are two, I'm sure if they're metal on the bagpipe, they might even still be reed. Anyway, there's two reeds that work exactly like an oboe, and they're inside the top of the chanter. See, see. Yeah. What the bag does is it, um, it allows the sound to be continuous. So you blow into the bag and keep that bag at pressure, mm -hmm. and you're going, and it's coming out of the bag in a continuous stream at the same pressure. Okay. Yeah, so the bag is a distraction. On the back, right? It just helps you. The, 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 the pipes, the chanters, and the drones, they are, as I say, they're automated oboes, basically. Okay. And, and harmonicas, likewise, work in a very similar way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's some scales we only have uh, five notes in rather than yeah. eight. The yeah. pentatonic scales. Oh, they're, and they're, there's they're... instruments made with just five holes in. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's, what's the benefits of well, you know, the pros well, and cons I mean, of those the, two um, if this is kind of a whole other lecture, but um, if you play a fundamental note on a recorder, you what we call overblowing it, you, you make a little hole at the back or you just blow a bit harder, you'll get the octave higher. If you overblow again, you get the fifth above that. If you overblow again, you get the fourth above that. Um, so there are some notes that are kind of naturally there um, on, on any wind instrument or, or on strings as well. And so in some cultures and in some types of folk music, they kind of stick to those notes, so the first ones, if you like. Um, the major scale is just one way of picking some of those frequencies. They're all there in the harmonics, but they're a very long way up, some of them. 
Um, the minor scale, you have to go even higher up the harmonics before you encounter that, that note. Um, what, we, what we've done in Western classical music is to, is to kind of take all the notes that are possible, quantizing it a bit, but taking, you know, saying, right, we're going to use all of these notes, we're going to use all these chromatic notes, and a lot of folk music doesn't do that. But you can still play a, a pentatonic scale on a piano. It's just that um, folk music that is based on pentatonic scales, why would you have, why would you drill enough holes for 12 notes if you're only going to use five of them? The disadvantage of a pipe that works that way is if you want to play a tune based on another keynote, you need a different pipe. Whereas this one, because it's got a few more holes in it and it's you know, drilled a slightly different way. It means I can get, I can get, I can play in C, but I can also at a stretch play in C sharp. Um, this I can definitely play in C sharp because I've got alternative fingers, fingerings available to me because of all the keys. Anything else? Yeah. I have a question actually. Yeah. So I guess constructing a, a a good instrument yeah. depends on quality of materials yeah. and excellent craftsmanship. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. But then uh, I was wondering. So, so basically, it depends on the detail yeah. and the accuracy of the of the person that yeah. uh, creates the yeah. instrument, right? But then I was thinking, okay, then if you compare uh, a guitar made in a factory yeah. and the guitar made by uh, a human being, an excellent yeah. craftsman. Yeah. It seems to me that the human being would make a better instrument. All the human beings are prone to errors. Yeah. So how, how does this uh, relate? It, it, it kind of depends on what you want. Okay. Um, if you want something which is utterly reliable, um, Yamaha are famous for this. They're, they're kind of um, not, they're, they're student level saxophones are good. That's kind of as far as it goes. You know, they, they will they will behave themselves. They will be reliable. They will they will they you should be able to get it in tune. The mechanisms will work. They're not very really, very exciting, really. Um, if you buy, but they the same company then make different you know models, which are a little bit have got a little bit more kind of. Um, subtlety built into them and you can actually get a really nice sound of that out of them they're much more much more um uh, how can i put it gives you more choices but they're all the same the good really good ones are all the same as well as the average ones now if you are um you're john hall um you are going to want a saxophone that does exactly what you want it to do and that's where uh, having an individual craftsman work on your instrument is an advantage because they might be, they can do something to your instrument that and set it up in a way that the factory at Yamaha would not do because maybe lots of other people might not be able to get a saxophone that's designed like that to work, let alone play beautifully. Um, so I suppose it's like anything where you've got the choice between mass produced, reliable, but not particularly characterful um, versus handmade, perhaps not, you know, perhaps you have to work harder to make it work, um, but might suit you perfectly. That's a real kind of generalization though, because there are also companies that make instruments and there are absolute millions that still make instruments that are really good to play. Um, so it's the character that... Yeah, it's, it's, I think one of the first, well, not one of the first things you learn, but when you get to a certain point of playing any instrument, you realise that however good the instrument is, it's only as good as the person that's playing it. Um, so providing it does its job and allows you to do the things with your throat or whatever and, you know, responds to that, that's, that's what matters. But there is also the other side of it, I guess, is that it's nice to have one that's been made for you. <laughs> And, yes. and sometimes just the fact that you, this is mine, yeah. Well, this, 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 this is my Yamaha, but it's, it's my Yamaha because Eddie set it up this way, you know. 
that might make you play better, even if there's, even if there's no real physics behind it. So it's, it's the psychology comes into it as well. Okay. Any other question? There's one more, I'm sorry. Why are some people, why do some people seem to not be able to hear the music? So why are people tone deaf compared to the music um, question? It might not be. <laughs> Uh, the question was, was why, why are some people tone deaf? There, there's two answers to that. One is that some people actually have congenital <laughs> amusia. Um, now, obviously, there's, it, maybe your ears don't work. That's the fundamental problem. But sometimes it's just in the brain, and the brain is just not wired up in a way to make it easy to, to notice differences between pitches. That's actually very, very uncommon. What is far more common is not having had a lot of practice with music. So maybe you've not done hardly any singing as a youngster. Um, and this is a muscle. So if you've not practiced hitting a pitch, then you're not going to do it very well unless you're mind bogglingly really talented. It does, it takes practice to do, like you know, I guess pole vaulting does. Um, so yeah, in a very small number of cases, it's that it just can't do it. In a much larger number of cases, it's can't do it yet. Can I say something else? <laughs> well, usually, at the end of the of the of the talk, we discuss things career-wise. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I know that you know it's kind of difficult for a musician to get into physics or get a physics job, but maybe it's not that difficult for a physicist to get into music. Is that true, or can they um, get into music? Oh yeah, well yes. Um, and actually, how? I mean, it's, as I said before, it's kind of the, the distinction isn't that clear. Um, in that most most good musicians know a bit of physics, mm. even if they they may not know the maths, to be fair, but they know usually quite a lot about how the physics works for their particular instrument. But yeah, you know, they wouldn't get a job as a an aircraft designer because they don't <laughs> know the maths. Sure. Um, but certainly, if you understand the maths of vibrations and waves, then that will definitely help you um, to, to do anything on the engineering side of music. Everything from designing a better flute or ukulele, or a better way of producing a flute or ukulele. As I said, the setting fret, fret on my ukulele isn't in quite the right place, and that's because it's a relatively inexpensive instrument. Um, you know, is there a way of producing a relatively inexpensive instrument where the frets will definitely be in exactly the right place? So you have to understand the physics, but you also have to understand the, the engineering and, and the mechanisation of that. Um, but as I, as I said in my, my list earlier, all of those sorts of things use the same equations. So if you're, I know so many people in bands I play in, in orchestras I play in and so on, their day job is one of the above, <laughs> yeah? And that is not a coincidence. It's, it's, it's partly due to a fascination with, with the same things. And it's also, if, you, if your day job is designing exhaust systems for cars and something goes wrong with your trombone, you're thinking in the right way, <laughs> yeah? So there are, um, but if you're likewise on the digital side, if you're used to working with networks, if you're used to working with A to D converters, if you're used to working with um, and, uh, with um, algorithms, all of those are utterly essential in the music industry. So yes, you know they they Brian, these are all related. Brian May, um, for instance. Hmm? Brian May, for instance. Well, yeah, Brian May is the classic example, isn't he? Yeah. Um, who? What's Brian May known known for? He's Queen's lead guitarist, yeah. He, he's, he's famous for, for um, standing on top of Buckingham Palace and, and playing, um, playing Queen hits. His background, though, was as a research physicist. He did, he did two thirds of his PhD at John Royal Bank, then became a rock star, went back and finished his PhD about 20 years ago, I think, um, in astrophysics. So, and he is not actually well, he's unusual in having a PhD in astrophysics, I guess, but he's not that unusual. Um, people who, uh, as I say, that's the day job, but they also do music, or they do music, but they're also actually really interested in the physics. It's, it doesn't always happen, 
but it is actually quite common. Definitely. Thank you very much, Helen. Any final questions? Let's thank the speaker again then. Thank you very much, Helen. very much and thank you everybody for coming out on such a cold evening um we we had to defrost our car to get out of the drive so i'm sure some of you did as well so that is appreciated thank you very much thank you. Please, please take some of the cookies left yes these sure physics has, has paid for them so please please do eat <laughs>